So welcome to Startup Grind Chilliwack. Our special guest this month is Maria Kalina, the founder of To Do Consulting. Everyone on your feet, and let's give a warm Startup Grind Chilliwack welcome to Maria. Okay, awesome. And I'm going to put you there in the hot thank seat. You. So Startup Grind Chilliwack is part of a global Startup Grind community. There's actually more than 600 of these chapters now in 170 countries, so it's pretty cool started in Silicon Valley, and it's really spread from there. Our values, make friends, give first, and help others. And it really comes down to being helpful and networking and meeting new people and not just sort of holding up in a corner and talking to those you know. Reach out and say, hey, what do you do, and how can I help? Uh, we've had some amazing sponsors over the last year. SEPCO, Accelerator, and the University of the Fraser Valley have been our sponsors. Let's hear it for those folks. And partners, these are the folks that are getting things done. So Cowork Chilliwack, Currency Marketing, Wisebox, and Around Chilliwack. Let's hear it for our partners. And if you are posting to social media, photos and so forth, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever's new these days, use the hashtag, hashtag Startup Grind. And like I said, our amazing guest this month is Maria. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for all for coming here. <laughs> yes. I'm really fascinated by your story. We had a, a chance to chat in advance, and you've got some great lessons that many of these folks can apply to their businesses, but I'm going to start and kind of walk through your history, and then we'll get to some actionable stuff that all of you guys can take away. Sure. But you grew up in Russia, which yeah, is a long way from Chilliwack. <laughs> it's a long way from Chilliwack. <laughs> and I was talking to you, and you said it's a small city outside of Moscow. I, I found this beautiful picture of Moscow, but yeah. your description of a small city was 500,000 people. Yeah, it was a small city of 500,000 people. <laughs> uh, what but was like, it called? For, for Russia, Ivanovo. Yeah, for that's Russia, why I didn't even try to spell it or put yeah. it on the slide. <laughs> just, just call it small city near Moscow. Fair enough. For Russia, it's not a. Uh, it's like it's a small because there are so many cities in the central Russia that mm. are that size. And what was it like growing up? <sighs> it was. <laughs> um, so I grew up uh, in a communist country uh, until I was ten, mm. and then it, it turned out into capitalism. <laughs> so yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> was that like a light switch or was it a slow build? Like there was no examples of entrepreneurs, um, were, were there? Yes. So uh, actually, I, I never had any example of uh, entrepreneurs in my childhood because uh, everything was planned by the government mm. and uh, uh, people just knew uh, where they're going to go to work and what they're going to do and uh, uh, where are they going to get money and uh, where, uh, what what they're going to spend them? <laughs> on one hand, on one hand, that sounds really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It may be. Uh, I didn't realize that uh, uh, I was a little kid. So. And your parents? I believe your mom was in in accounting, and your father in management of some sort. Uh, so my mom was an accountant, and my dad was uh, working in a bank. But it was after that happened. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, uh, before that, uh, they were working for a computer science uh, institute. Hmm. And they were like huge computers okay. uh, all over the wall. Right. And they were printing some like long, long papers, as far as I remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then the technology uh, grew up drastically, and uh, those computers, they just uh, hmm. died. <laughs> Got it. I think I have, uh, this is a photo of you around 17. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And the, I think the, you're with a nephew. The baby is not mine. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's my nephew. And this guy is now uh, 23, I guess. <laughs> and I think of myself at 17, typical teenager, hanging out with friends, going to the mall, BMXing, whatever it might have been. What was your childhood like? Um, Ch uh, childhood, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was hanging out with my friends, <laughs> but. When I was 17, about that age, I was uh, curious how the companies work. Mm. And uh, as soon as my mom was working as an accountant for an insurance company, I just uh, I checked it out uh, once uh, d during summer. 
break, and uh, I helped to do some work there. So, yeah, I was I was super curious how 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 those companies function and how how people are working there, what they're doing, and how how do they make money. Um, and then uh, maybe next year I. Don't remember exactly. Maybe I was in the university already. I checked uh, my my dad's bank okay. <laughs> the same way, <laughs> so I helped there a little bit. Mm -hmm. He was the head of operations uh, um, operations unit there, and uh, I was doing some like I was just looking for some numbers of the documents, as far as I remember. So okay. I needed it for for something. And were you inspired by that, or were you saying this is um, not for me? I, I was saying this is not for me. <laughs> Got it. So university studies have been a big part of your life. Not only did you start with a five-year degree, but you've done additional post-secondary, and you're just completing another master's right now from UBC. But talk about your first stint in university. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly learning. It is just a, my, it's just a part of my life. If I'm not learning, I don't feel like I'm evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, first degree was strategic management. Uh, I was actually looking for a language degree, but my parents, they, they said that, oh, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna be a teacher of English? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, uh, and teachers, uh, teachers of English in Russia, they, uh, the salaries of teachers of English are very, very low. Mm. So that was not like prestigious. <laughs> Got it. Um, and I followed my parents' uh, advice mm -hmm. and went to study business. <laughs> well, I actually Googled and put a little star on it. So that's Moscow oh, yeah. to, the, to the south and St. Petersburg to the north. Because yes. describing Langley, that's Chilliwack, exactly and Burnaby, there. these folks would get it, but uh, <laughs> not so much that. But um, So that was the Ivanovo State Power University. Yes. I, and talk to me about that experience. Um, so did you move away from home, and were you in dormitories? Uh, no, I, I was at home. So that was so pretty close was, to where you lived. Pretty, pretty close to where I lived, and uh, in, at, at the third year, I started the second degree, which was actually to the language. Okay. <laughs> because <laughs> I wanted, and uh, I I did the dual degree. Uh, one was because uh, that's management. just easy, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and the other one <laughs> <laughs> needed a bit of a challenge. And the other one was uh, uh, translator, uh, English, Russian, in okay. professional communications. So it was like additional uh, certificate to my first degree. So growing up, w you're very fluent in English. When did you start to learn English? Um, at school. Okay. It, it is the uh, number one language they learn in school. Okay. Usually in Russia. And would, was that an elective? You could say, I want to learn English, or was it, this is, you're going to... It was actually, uh, there were two languages to elect. Okay. Uh, one was English and the other one was French. And hmm. uh, I, I found myself in a French group uh, because they distributed somehow. Okay. <laughs> Maybe they didn't, didn't give me a choice and I was so disappointed. And then I talked to someone and they placed me into the English group. Hmm. And the, the first mark uh, for, uh, like, we, we, we do uh, the grades in Russia, uh, they are from uh, two to five. Okay. Two is very bad, you don't pass. Okay. And five is excellent. So um, rather than A, B, C, D, yeah. five yeah. is an yeah. A, basically. Yeah, so the first, the first mark was two. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> didn't pass. Okay. <laughs> And uh, this was for, uh, so I needed to write down some numbers and uh, letters, like they are in English. Right. And uh, I just didn't do this uh, accurately. <laughs> yeah, even when I Google half the letters on there, I don't understand what they are. <laughs> I could read Moscow, but uh, yes. Yeah, when I zoomed out, oh, okay, now I understand that I'm in Russia. Because to me, and probably the folks in the room, Russia seems a bazillion miles away. Did the West or... I suppose mm. you're adjacent to Europe, so you're influenced by that. But when you thought about America or Canada, it's, it's the other side of the world. I think that there was actually... Um, America was, in, when I was a kid, uh, America was uh, in my brother's music that he was listening. Okay. And that's, that's all I knew about America. 
So would that be like <laughs> bootleg? Somehow he's getting tapes of American music? Or? Uh, yeah, he had uh, those vinyls. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's that's what was like all the West and America. Uh, I don't think that there were. Um, uh, that was uh, a Cold War. Yeah. At that time, maybe they started to do some connections already, but um, hmm. not not a lot. Um, yeah, it 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 became better after nineties. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned languages, but at this point you were inspired by languages. You started to to do another degree in English, and your first uh, entrepreneurial stint was finishing that degree and then moving to St. Petersburg, which is a long way away. Oh, it was, it was actually second. Okay. <laughs> you can correct anything that I've surmised here and then put it straight on the record. But but how did you go? You mean you're home-based mm -hmm. and then, like, that's a long way away. How many hour drive is that? I drove. Uh, I drove. Okay. <laughs> and it was uh, 13 hours drive. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it was 13 hours drive. And then I came back several times to, to visit my parents also driving. Got it. But in St. Petersburg, and I've got another beautiful picture of this city. Oh, that's my favorite spot. How did I, you find it? <laughs> St. Petersburg, <laughs> Google Images. <laughs> I'm, I'm breaking all sorts of copyright law right now. <laughs> but it's extremely metropolitan and beautiful. Uh, what was the culture like there? So St. Petersburg is like... Um, a museum. It's like you live in inside a museum. Hmm. You go yeah, out you and you are in, in the museum if you are in downtown. Um, and uh, it was built in 17th, 18th century by Italian designers. Hmm. So the Tsar uh, Piotr, he brought uh, Italian designers from Italy and uh, asked them to build the city. So contrast St. Petersburg versus Moscow. Uh, Moscow is more business. Okay. Um, uh, more a commercial, more of a commercial center, and uh, the uh, I heard that like eighty percent of money is concentrated in Moscow, and uh, Saint Petersburg is more a more touristic place and uh, more history. So your first experience, and you used the term, I was invited to be a founder. Uh, with the connection group. Yeah. What does that mean, invited to be a founder? So actually, uh, that was the second one. And uh, <laughs> the first experience was very similar. Uh, I, when I was a, in the university, I was invited to be a founder of a translation agency. Okay. Um, and we were students, hmm. 20 years old, or 21, 20, I guess. Um, uh, so we were just, uh, we didn't know how to build a business. Uh, it was just like, okay, let's do that. And uh, we didn't know how to sell. We didn't know, even know that we need to sell. <laughs> so <laughs> who, who is we? Was it yourself and one other um, person, three other people? There were, uh, there were two, uh, my, uh, two of my classmates uh, from the linguistic um, mm -hmm. uh, group and uh, one professor. Huh. <laughs> and so was the professor by default the CEO, kind of, or was everybody... No, no, no professor wasn't initiating that. We were initiating that, so we okay. were professor was invited. So and as an early startup, do you have those discussions around what does the share structure look like? Are we each, uh, we just, we each just even? We just 25% each. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Consensus, everybody on the same page. Um, we didn't even have this like this point of discussion, so it was just like let's do that. Uh, we didn't know what value proposition is like <laughs> <laughs> that that we need to have any. We were given some office uh, by uh, by the friends of uh, our professor, okay, and it was free for us. And then we were given some space for advertising in downtown uh, with our phone number. It was also free, hmm. and we were just like. Uh, we didn't make a lot of money there, though. It was just like... For so who were some out. of your first customers that wanted translation uh, services? There were people who, who needed the translation services. They, For example, they need, needed to collect some documents to go okay. to Europe. 
or uh, to bring someone to to from. So it wasn't even it was personal people needing some sort of translation. Mm -hmm. And when is it primarily Russian to English, or was it? A um, it, it was it was mostly Russian to English because we had uh, this kind of trans translators in our mm -hmm. network. Um, Maybe there were a couple of German cases, but I don't, I don't remember exactly right now. Hmm. <laughs> and at that point, were you utilizing the internet, or was this just picking had, up the phone and dialing? We had a website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a website. Um, the way you say that is people, you weren't really proud of that website, were you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> uh, just like the, uh, People uh, came uh, mostly by that advertising in downtown. Okay. And you had a storefront, they would knock on the door and say, I have these documents. Uh, they, they, they dialed the number, mm -hmm. and then we explained them how to get to the office, and then mm -hmm. they came with documents. And, and you mentioned a network of out. translators. So there was the core four of you, but then you would job out yeah, to we, people. Yeah, we would job out uh, because we didn't have the uh, certificates yet, okay. so we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we jobbed out the, uh, the work to the, the, those who have certificates. Hmm. <laughs> And I find that an interesting model because how do you know that you're getting accurate translation? Is there a is there a way to verify that? Uh, yeah. So if if it is about the documents, then um, then uh, uh, the translator will go to the notary, and the notary will certify um, using the certificate to okay. certify that the translation is made by a certified translator. Hmm. Yes, we needed to verify them before we give them the work, so we needed to know that those guys are good. Right. <laughs> hmm. And that was just word of mouth connecting to different translating folks somehow? Yeah, it was like an intermediary work. Actually. And so that was initial group. What was that called? Uh, it was Terra, terra Lingua. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I have often thought that startup names or or drug names you could have like a drinking game. <laughs> is this uh, is this a drug name or is this a <laughs> is this a startup name? But it's typically yeah. the mashup of different words, and then you check the internet. Can I get that URL and so forth? But, so. Jumping from there to the connection group, was it a, a straight line? Was it the same people, or was it no. different? A different city. Okay. Different people. Got it. Uh, same business, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, same kind of business. But in this case, we, uh, we realized that we needed to figure out the value proposition mm. <laughs> so that uh, we are differentiated somehow from, from the competition. Um, and it was actually after I uh, spent uh, several years in a textile company working in sales. Mm. So I tried the corporate world right. and then um, start up. Yeah, and game. you mentioned you were recruited into this textile company, quite a large corporation, so that would have been new for you, yeah. and quite young, and you rapidly advanced, and yeah. you mentioned imposter syndrome. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was 21. Uh, I, I, I was done with uh, the first startup uh, as soon as I graduated, <laughs> because like everyone wanted to try to so work. So back with up a second. You had two degrees going and a startup uh, at yeah. the same time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I did. Um, Lazy Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> I was just curious how that works. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and then they hired me into sales, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, I was like very rapidly promoted, maybe in two or three years, into sales director. Um, and so, describe textiles. What is, are you selling? It were, they were, those were fabrics. Okay. Like in bulk. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fourth textile company, fourth large textile company in Russia. Um, and then. So is this like high-end fashion or middle of the road <laughs> or just to uh, everybody? I would say. Eco Economy to so the Russian medium. version of Walmart <laughs> kind of yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. and th and those were bed linen as well mm. um, so yeah the first uh, the imposter syndrome <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like I was twenty five or twenty six and I was a sales director managing eight people there uh, and I was like are they making any mistake. Are they like? <laughs> Do you feel that your <laughs> your degree in management did was it helpful or was that sort um, of a distant memory and you were just figuring it out? So it 
was helpful, but like I figured it out during that startup and uh, that uh, work in that in textile company that practice and theory is like super different. Mm -hmm. um, I applied the concepts like marginality <laughs> and uh, uh, I learned a little bit about marketing so mm -hmm. that it exists and th that you need to do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, a lot of finance stuff, which is uh, very valuable for uh, different aspects of the business. Um, uh, then production planning, th mm -hmm. this, this things that uh, that gave uh, the holistic approach. Right. So when I was doing sales, I understood that uh, there is a production planning, and I need to consider and finance and like uh, all the holistic picture. So mm -hmm. that, that's that's what degree was for. Okay. And working in a large company, how many people worked at the textile company? Um, there were like 50, 70. And, okay. and also, uh, I, I don't count the, uh, the factories. Mm. There were also factories. So okay. in the office, 50, 70, and then the factories. And so that would be your first taste of hierarchy, office politics, yeah. all of the... <laughs> Imposter syndrome. Yeah, right. <laughs> How did you survive? How did you thrive in that environment? Um, I had a very empowering boss. Mm. Um, so he knew how to do sales very well. But like I brought new ideas, how we can do the processes better, how we can organize, how we can hire uh, better, faster, more mm -hmm. efficiently, mm -hmm. um, better people. Um, how, like, where, where else we can sell, and uh, he just gave me authority to uh, make that happen. And was this, was your client base all within Russia, or, or was it beyond Russia? Uh, mostly Russia, but also like uh, the closest countries like Belarus, Ukraine, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan. And so after the USSR crumbled and it and it went from communism to capitalism, those external countries that were formed, were there still trade relationships yeah, between there were, them? Yeah, there were trade relationships and uh, uh, it was uh, quite easy to expor export and import. Okay. So not a lot of duties and paperwork. Got it. So some mm -hmm. free trade agreement of mm -hmm. sort. And yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, what have I got next here? Ah, uh, yes. Um, you joined Lumix and were with them for eight years. And yeah. so just before we dive into this, what the heck do they build and sell? So it's the, an R&D and manufacturing company, mm -hmm. and uh, they R&D and manufacture laboratory instrumentation. And uh, the major sectors that uh, they supply to are uh, environment, agriculture, and academia. Hmm. And what are they measuring? Uh, mercury, for example. <laughs> okay. Um, toxic metals, uh, parameters of uh, wine quality, such as organic acids. Hmm. And then uh, there is a newly developed innovation as PCR analyzer, and it can detect DNA and RNA. So that was a big jump from textiles, learning, uh, jumping into a, a, yeah. a technology yeah. company. Yeah. Yeah. Were you quite excited by that? Um, or that intimidated? So at that time, I was uh, exhausted by sales, <laughs> especially <laughs> by the uh, um, outbound calls that I, mean, I, I, I did a lot of them during the last startup. So I just said that I don't want to do sales. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I wanted to move into finance more, um, more finance, uh, do more finance work. And I applied for finance degree and master's. And uh, uh, I just put my CV... Um, like finance related, whatever finance related I've done in my life, okay. I just put there. And uh, they invited me to, Lumix invited me to uh, join them as a business analyst. And like when I, when I came for the interview, I was amazed by the technology that they are doing, hmm. by the entrepreneurship spirit that they have, being like medium sized company. But right. And uh, uh, by the, attention to the customer that they are um, given. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and by the constant innovation that is going on there. So I was just like, okay, I will learn that stuff. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> and that is truly an international company. So that was the first foyer into that. Yeah. Uh, was their main business in Russia or in Europe, or where were um, they selling? So their R&D and manufacturing and facilities are in Russia and in Canada. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the sales facilities uh, offices are in Russia, Canada, Germany, and China. So Russia and Canada, how was that partnership originally formed? Uh, uh, they uh, branched out. Um, and... Uh, uh, like to to reach the markets, different mm -hmm. markets, uh, it's uh, easier to be located in the markets. Got it. Um, was Canada more logical than the U.S. just from a like a business standpoint? Like, what was the advantage there? I, I think that they were. Uh, I don't know the whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they were uh, costs okay. associated with that. So maybe yeah. Canada is more um, uh, favorable for the from the cost perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, did you travel amongst these different regions early on? Um, I traveled to China. Uh, I didn't travel to a uh, German office. Um, yeah, and here. Hmm. And so, China, tell me about that. Um, China. <laughs> <laughs> I understand in principle what China is, but, but your experience there, did you go to... Like, was it Beijing or...? Yeah, yeah. the offices, and uh, the other company offices in Beijing, mm -hmm. and it works, like, super differently. They are um, super hardworking and disciplined there. Um, there, are, uh, there is only a sales team, um, sales and application support. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I would think to sell culture. into China with technology would be difficult in that they could potentially reverse engineer what you're doing and create it for much cheaper. Did that Yeah, they usually usually it works like backwards, right? right. <laughs> so Chinese companies uh, mm -hmm. bring uh, the technologies here but uh, it's uh, so um, uh, sophisticated mm -hmm. that uh, um, maybe uh, um, it's not easy for uh, to make it in China. Got it. They, they like m something that is more scalable and uh, mass, so mm -hmm. I think that... And through that, I would imagine that Lumix has really protected their um, inventions through patents and other yeah. protection, Yeah, right? everything is And protected. did you touch on that at all with, within your organization? Um, only when I was preparing analytics, being a head of corporate development, mm -hmm. uh, then just I just know how much those patents cost. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Not only cost, but to maintain as well, right? And, yeah, and yeah, you have yeah. to do them in each region that yeah. you're doing business. Yeah. And yeah, and how I've, many I've registered out. a couple of trademarks and then you start getting these um, form letters. You want to protect this mm -hmm. in uh, Belarus or Sweden. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, and it's every single little country. Yes. They have uh, some um, bulks of the countries. Right. As far as I remember, so you can protect, like... Got it. Um, hmm. Many countries uh, at the same time, but, yeah. So I'm curious, you mentioned business analyst. What is that job? Uh, that job was uh, uh, business planning, mostly. Okay. For, for the projects, and... Uh, um, so would, would you be involved in, say, we're going to do a new product... Uh, yeah. And how are we going to not only price this out, but market it and enter the market yeah. and so forth? Yeah, it's just like, just like you said. <laughs> okay, sounds like a, sounds like a lot of meetings. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> you gotta have a lot of meetings uh, uh, to actually uh, to gather the information from different stakeholders mm -hmm. and to create that picture, the holistic picture of uh, how it will look like. And so you would have. A th to touch all the different parts of the company and kind of have free reign to do that. So you must have learned a lot during yeah, that. Yeah, you needed to touch R&Z manufacturing, marketing, uh, finance. And all sorts of learn to deal with all sorts of personalities too, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, people yeah. doing inventions are maybe yeah. need to be treated different than people in finance. Yeah, those are, <laughs> those are different. Mm -hmm. Like, I um, truly admire uh, people who do science because I n I never, um, I've never done that. And mm -hmm. uh, um, 
did this grow out of academia at all? Like the research end of it, was it affiliated with the university or, or was it just truly a, a startup on its own? Uh, the founders, they came from the university. Mm -hmm. they, they worked in the university together, so yeah. Neat. And tell me about this picture. <laughs> so it's not me doing a workshop, it's me doing an introduction for, to the workshop. Okay. <laughs> Um, it, it, it was a workshop for uh, PCR technology, microchip-based PCR technology, and uh, I was just doing an introduction. Hmm. <laughs> um, we were trying uh, different ways of, uh, uh, of the promotion in North America and uh, uh, the, uh, the ways that work for uh, the creation of trust because um, this brand is not recognized in North America, mm -hmm. was not recognized in North America that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, ways that we found are uh, given the value, education. Right. So we did workshops and uh, webinars and these kind of things. So this maybe should have been after this slide because it sounds like that workshop was in Canada. Yeah. I'm really curious <laughs> on not only your move to Canada, but Lumix's ability to sell into North America. Like, it, was it difficult representing a Russian company selling to the Western world, or was it just, did the technology speak for itself? Uh, the company um, has a worldwide reputation mm -hmm. uh, for a while, uh, and uh, uh, the history in North America started more than 10 years ago, um, when there was a, um, Mercury uh, emergency in the U.S. Okay. Uh, and uh, 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 with the help of distributor, uh, they started to sell uh, hmm. mercury analyzers. And uh, now the mercury analyzers are re uh, recognized by U.S. EPA. Um, so yeah, that, okay. that that really helps to gain the credibility with the. Are customers. there a lot of competitors in that space now? Um, it. It's uh, like the mercury analysis, it's uh, quite niche. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some competitors, but Lumix is quite strong uh, in this niche. And their Canadian location, headquarters is in Mission, right? Yeah. And so you moved from Russia to Canada. Uh, <laughs> how did that happen? What did your family think? Um, so uh, my family think I'm crazy because uh, uh, my mom, like uh, in Russia you need two documents, to tra uh, one, uh, one just a passport, and the other one uh, you need to travel somewhere else outside of Russia. And she doesn't even have that document. Okay. <laughs> so she, she didn't uh, leave Russia. <laughs> she went to Belarus, but they, you don't need the, the document uh, to go there. So, um, and they, they, they really don't understand how I'm traveling the cities, traveling the countries, and like, changing the countries, changing the jobs, and uh, starting my businesses. So they just like, yeah, because probably uh, the mentality is different. They grew up in Soviet Union. Got it. Was it a culture shock for you, or was it, um, was it pretty so, easy to move? Uh, it was surprisingly easy. I uh, was expecting that it, it would be hard to, to do uh, that move, but... Um, it was surprisingly easy. The most challenge that I faced, uh, probably, it was language. Mm -hmm. um, even not the language itself, but the accent that mm. I uh, um, needed to learn. <laughs> and uh, like I'm still, uh, sometimes I'm I, 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 I'm going to a, a coffee shop and still I, I, I want a raspberry cookie mm. and I need to repeat it like maybe four times <laughs> so that they understand. <laughs> so, if they're yeah. write, writing Maria on the cup, they're getting all of our names wrong. So <laughs> I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah probably it's the, the most challenge that I had. Uh, first, I uh, got used to how people speak and uh, mm -hmm. uh, to comprehend them so that I understand at least 70% uh, of what they are saying. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that stage, I could communicate. <laughs> <laughs> and from a technical standpoint, did Lumix essentially sponsor you with a visa? Is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah. And did yeah. you have to 
talk to any Canadian officials or, or see anybody, or was the documentation done? And uh, when I arrived to to the airport, I I, I should talk to someone. <laughs> Got it. You need to go through those doors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how did that go? I. Uh, you had easy. the documents, and it was pretty easy. Yeah, pretty easy. Yeah. No hurdles. <laughs> and did you relocate to Mission, or were you in Vancouver and then taking the West Coast Express, or how did how did you get to work? So I was always uh, around Tri City, mm -hmm. um, uh, partially because I wanted to do my UBC degree uh, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be in the middle. Um, I was driving <laughs> Lockheed Highway. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And in Russia, you drive on the right, right? It's or are you on the left? Uh, same. Same. Yeah. yeah. Same. Yeah. Easy. Um, this is you in representing Lumix Industries Canada. I would think at, at a expo. Yeah. At an expo. Yeah. Yeah. Just standing near by a technology that I understand the value proposition, but I mm -hmm. don't understand <laughs> how it works actually. Got it. <laughs> Well, I wanted, so that gives the, the base of how you got here, and, and now you said, after eight years, I'm going to strike out on my own, and you've started a company called To Do Consulting, Yeah. and you're three or four months into that. Yeah, it's actually an evolution of what I was I, I doing all the 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was always taking projects for consulting. Um, my first project was market research for textile. Okay. <laughs> and uh, there were several others. I helped uh, uh, different startups to figure out the uh, uh, business models and business drivers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also I did a business training once. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it, it, it was it, it's uh, the next step for me. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as I realized that I can pay my bills and not go into the office, I just left the office. Okay. And so you can still have a permanent visa, permanent residence, permanent residence and, and do that. So I think the meat of it, we're going to talk about your actual process that you've created. Yeah. yeah. And I want to go into depth here because I think it'll be extremely helpful for those folks that are either contemplating a startup in a small or medium-sized enterprise and, and trying to define whether it's a new product or, or how, to, how to do that. So we're going to walk through your value proposition process. Yeah. So tell me about this slide and, and what, uh, it, what it means. So um, uh, the value proposition is, is usually um, required by uh, startups who, are, uh, who have idea mm -hmm. and uh, they want to figure out uh, whether it's... Uh, uh, where is the product market fit mm -hmm. uh, for this idea, and uh, or uh, another uh, other situations when a company is going with existing product to a new market, or it is uh, the same market but they are uh, doing a new product development, mm -hmm. or another way uh, they are growing but uh, something is happening and the revenue is stalled and they want to figure out why. So uh, those are si the situation where um, this is. Um, uh, applicable, right? And uh, um, uh, value proposition is the uh, place in uh, uh, the customer's mind uh, where um, the potential place in customer's mind where the, your uh, product or service I is going to be located. Hmm. Um, and, and you've got a. This is just an overview, but describe what we're seeing on this screen. So uh, here, uh, I just put. I just made up uh, uh, an example of mm -hmm. networking app because no one now is doing networking apps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and uh, let's say that uh, the customer segments segment um, that we are working on right now is uh, uh, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. um, more specifically startups. And uh, uh, we can see a map uh, that uh, uh, will show that, that place in the customer's mind. Got it. Uh, as, uh, as and this is really the end result of the next slides. I, can, yeah, do you yeah, want to walk the, through? This is the end, end result of Got what it. we are going to, to go through. Okay. So step one is identifying customer segments. 
So in this case of networking app Z or Z, how would you start to define that? Yeah, so usually um, you have a product and you have several customer segments. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you just need to list uh, any of them that you can think of uh, and choose one for that work. We need to, to choose one. And, and then, what, what and then would you can work on another one on a separately mm -hmm. and on the third one. And what would it, like an example segment be? Um, is it location-based or age-based or? It, it depends on uh, how you look at the market. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, uh, for example, networking app works throughout Canada, let's say. Okay. And like we, it, we work throughout Canada and uh, the customer segment, uh, you, just, you just define that uh, they can be startups, they can be people in transition uh, who, are, who are changing their work. Mm -hmm. um, and they need to network uh, for that reason. Uh, and they can be uh, people from growing companies, but you just want to focus the startups and see what they need. Okay. So this would be, for lack of a, a better description, doing a very specific yeah. LinkedIn to, to talk to startups. Yeah. And so what, what segments would you have to fill out that? You mentioned... Canada being one, so a location, yeah. um, new founders, particular business. Yeah. Uh, are there others? Would you get you as deep go, down to like, like male, female, or uh, if if it if it matters mm -hmm. for for the product, then you go uh, male, female. If mm -hmm. if the age of the customer matters, then you go age. Uh, then you then you segment by age. If the location matters, then you segment by location. Sometimes it uh, sometimes you have just one location where you want to your Got first it. step, and you focus that location, and you go mm -hmm. into the segments uh, inside this location. And so you said, if that matters, how do you define if if that particular mm categorization or carving it up matters? Is it obvious or is it? Great question. Um, uh, first, it depends on your decision because you probably, um, you, um, how, how, how many resources you, you want, uh, mm -hmm. you, you have, like, uh, is there only one of you and you can go locally, just locally mm -hmm. right now, and then, then you will scale somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think like many entrepreneurs, they see the world as their opportunity and and as soon as you start to say, well, you need to specialize in this particular mm -hmm. industry or, or product type, it seems very limiting. But, but for what you're saying is the more that you can dig down, it's a better place to start from. Uh, it, it's, a decision, it's a choice of uh, an entrepreneur, so um, yeah. Hmm. And so step one, identify con customer segments, choose one. So would you put those segments across the top, essentially? Yeah, I just put it, customer segment, entrepreneur startups. Let's, let's, and let's the 54321, what does that mean? Uh, we, will, we, will we will get to that, get okay. To that, yeah. <laughs> Ready for the next slide? Okay. And so step two, identifying customer needs. What do you know slash think is important for them when they are solving their problem. Yeah. I definitely need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know or think uh, is important for them when they are solving their problem? So it's, uh, uh, it depends on how, how much of an information uh, from the customers you have, mm -hmm. whether you conducted uh, interviews or not, you can hypothesize. Uh, even if you didn't talk to anyone, you can uh, make a hypothesis and then mm -hmm. go to the customer and uh, uh, ask specific questions. So it can, it can work either ways, after interviews or before the interviews. Okay. And that's important to reach out to who you think could be your potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And in other realms, it's perhaps called developing an MVP or a minimal viable product or... I know Clayton Christensen uh, from Harvard talks about what job are you, mm -hmm. are you hiring this product or service to do for you and really yeah. digging into yeah. that. Yeah, and there is a value proposition framework uh, that includes um, pains, gains, jobs, and uh, pain relievers, uh, gain creators, and okay. value proposition. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a great framework, and uh, I just... Uh, have mine uh, to, um, I try to simplify all right. the thing and include the competition there. Yeah, because it can get pretty complex if you're trying to do it mm -hmm. by the academia way and I like what you've done. And so... I'm trying to simplify academia. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I've done a lot of academia and now I'm trying to simplify that. So let's see what kind of notes I've got here. So on this one, 
Um, ready for the next one? Yeah, sure. Okay. So this one is ranking the importance of customer needs. And so what would you do in this phase? Uh, here, uh, y you listed the needs. I, I made them up, all, mm -hmm. all the needs that are here, the reliability, user interface, uh, time spent. Um, and uh, you try to think how uh, much of importance the customer uh, puts on that need. Mm -hmm. And uh, rank them from one to five. And is this a solitary exercise, or do, if you have a small group of founders or people you're working with, would each pe person do this independently, or would you work through it together? How would this work? So, uh, if uh, uh, the founder has all the information in mind, then I will work with the founder. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes they bring together tech uh, or scientists and right. uh, uh, marketing people and sales. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists uh, understand the product uh, from the features mm -hmm. uh, point of view, and they usually know the competition features features as well, and uh, sales understand uh, customers. So uh, in your scenario, you're saying you need a guide to help you through this. Would it be dangerous to try to do this on your own? No. No? <laughs> it would <laughs> be worthwhile? You can do those steps on your own. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else about this step that we need to know? Um, just, just put the number uh, of in front of any need uh, from one to five, uh, based on your perception on how the customer, um, how how this 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 uh, quality or need is important for the customer. So I like how your your rating system goes back to grades in Russian <laughs> elementary school. Yeah, <laughs> that comes from there. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> but uh, if I do like A B C D, probably it would be weird, right? Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so step four, identify competitors, substitutes, and alternatives. So in this networking app, Z example, um, I can't read on our small screen what those say, but what, what yeah. are you doing in this phase? So you uh, f I try to identify, you are trying to identify all the competitors that exist, um, companies that do something similar. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also you need to consider the substitutes like whatever, how, however they uh, they um, solve their problem in a different way, right? Like using the apps, for example, uh, through networking events, they go go out and network instead of using the app, and then um, something that um, uh, that they, for example, if they if they don't do anything, it's also an alternative. Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or if they are asking uh, or waiting for introductions by their friends. It's also an alternative, but not the competition. And so value proposition and product market fit are obviously intertwined. Um, yeah. At the end of a value proposition, are you coming up with the product market fit, or is that a different exercise? Um, so product market fit is where uh, you are meeting the customer needs. Either mm -hmm. those are pains or gains, or like, uh, and the value proposition is uh, the uh, um, the the it 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 includes uh, um, so they are like uh, product market fit and value proposition they are almost the same. <laughs> Got it. And uh, um, value proposition are more about uh, differentiation from the competition than product market fit, mm -hmm. but like. And how much following a, a process like this or another? Like it, how much can you get right speculating before launching? Like there's going to be a tremendous amount of feedback and pivoting and adjusting. The more you talk to the customers, uh, the, the more precise it will be, the hmm. less than. Okay, step five, um, map customer needs versus competition. Yeah, so we are, we've identified the uh, uh, competitors, substitutes, and alternatives, and uh, we put your product, let's say that app Z, <laughs> um, and uh, the competitors, alternatives, and substitutes uh, from one to five on the left, where the performance rank is. One is poor, five is the best. Excellent. <laughs> Got it. Um, so, yeah, and uh, uh, once you've done, uh, some of the needs will not be met by uh, some competitors or alternatives, and uh, there will they will be only your product there. Um, 
And if you find um, something like that, it's the blue ocean. Hmm. So if there is the need and no one meets that that one, then then it's your blue ocean. Got it. Uh, in this particular example, there is no blue ocean, but there is an area. Um, and we probably... Uh, and by blue it. ocean, that's a whole... That's the uh, whole concept. Right. Uh, uh, the blue ocean, it's uh, um, about the, the strategy of finding uh, the uh, uh, customer needs that uh, are not... Um, are not met by, by, by someone else. Got Sometimes it. Sometimes the customer doesn't even know that they exist. And how long can you exist in a blue ocean? Like if you're getting traction and, and success in that, then there's going to be followers, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. It, uh, it actually is about like h how much of the market you can gain um, being there for a while. Got it. And so when, if you think back to Lumix's case, their blue ocean was just the, the level of their technology and... Mm, I would say that uh, there are always uh, competitors or uh, substitutes in that case. Mm. And so then in a situation like that, what did it come down to? Price or...? Um, the value proposition of Lumix is, uh, uh, I would say, it's uh, flexibility mm -hmm. first and the efficiency second. Uh, flexibility in fast reaction on uh, specific inquiries. Uh, so they are winning by um, responding to emergencies, okay. to specific customer problems um, faster than uh, the large bureaucratic mm. organizations. Got it. Um, so we're on step five here. I think there's a step six. So it's the same, but it's basically find the areas where your product stands out. And that's where you're concentrating. That's where you're finding your value proposition. Yeah, 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 yeah. I probably um, didn't complete that drawing. So <laughs> 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 I was I was going to circle uh, the four Zs that okay. are um, that are in the in the up upper mm -hmm. medium part. Mm -hmm. So that's what we can call uh, the value proposition. And so having gone through this exercise what would their go-to-market strategy look like? Now we're ready to develop the app to, mm -hmm. to meet these needs or to, to launch with a, a particular segment? Um, they, first, they need to go out to the customers and check that mm -hmm. hypothesis. <laughs> and if uh, confirmed, then uh, uh, the, uh, uh, those are the uh, number one, two, three uh, needs that they need to address. In, their, in, in the creation of the product and in the sales pitch. And I imagine going through something like this versus just having an idea and then fully building it out, spending all sorts of time and energy and money and then realizing that there's actually no market for it, it's a typical yeah. problem that many entrepreneurs yeah. would have. Yeah. How do you, what would your advice be to step back and, and go through something like this? Um, just do it? <laughs> uh, you mean uh, go through something like well, that? Well, I think there's different schools of thought. We're just going to... Many folks may have just been started a business, a service business, and, and they just have grown organically. If you think back to the, yeah. the connection yeah. group, you just, you're just you thrown into business and you try to figure it out. Yeah, um, in a hard way. Right. <laughs> do you think that this is... Is better for just a, or just as applicable for a, just a brand new startup as someone who's long in business that then is trying to figure out what their next step is. Um, so I, I feel like some people are really lucky, and uh, uh, some entrepreneurs they have um, like they have the product and uh, they have this intuition. So they don't need to go through the frameworks, mm. tools, and, and uh, uh, something like that. They have this intuition, and they probably talk to enough number of people to uh, make sure that it works. Mm -hmm. And that's why they act, and uh, everything works. Um, and uh, also, I, I really believe that there can be simple tools, simplified business concepts that can help entrepreneurs to do it on their own. Mm. Well, great. Next up is some Q&A, but before that, I'd like to thank Maria for sharing her insights and journey. Let's hear it for her. Thanks for listening. <laughs>